We are looking today uh, at a case study of the broader set of rituals we looked at in the last session, namely life cycle liturgies. Um, this one uh, that we'll take out and look at in more detail is a set of liturgies um, that surround dying and death. And as a kind of footnote, I simply want to acknowledge that uh, many years ago, my first ever liturgy class I cho chose to take was called Liturgy in the Face of Death. It was an elective. There were exactly two people in that class. <laughs> um, so it ended up being a private tutorial, but it really changed my life because I thought, Finally, someone is doing theology around a topic of ultimate importance. How much more existential can you get? And it um, really started me on a path of finding um, liturgical studies um, fascinating. So I simply want to acknowledge that. I want to open with a prayer. It's um, a prayer that is origin it, that whose original language is one of the languages spoken in Uganda that I do not know. So I will read it in English translation. It was a prayer given to me by a Ugandan friend who was taught this prayer uh, to say and pray every day. Um, if you cannot enter into it, and theologically it does raise issues, um, let it pass by you. Let us pray. O oh Lord, my God, I accept from this day the manner of death which you have prepared for me. I accept it with its timing, pain, and circumstances. I accept all that willingly and gladly because I know it will be from your hands. Amen. An admission, uh, first not an admission, just a heads up, I will be focusing uh, on the early centuries, um, meaning the first thousand years of the emergence of Christian ritualizing around uh, practices of facing dying and death. That means we will skip over at least a thousand years of complex developments. Um, we'll skip over issues that have arisen today, for the most part, um, and instead look um, intensely at how Christians begin to take a funda fundamental fact of human life, the fact that everybody journeys towards dying and death um, and Christianize it in a sense. So again, I said this last time, these aren't rituals that drop out of heaven with Jesus. They emerge and are constructed and made by Christian communities over centuries in conversations with earlier practices of facing death, burying the dead, and remembering them. Another caveat about this emergence of early Christian uh, practices, um, we need to remember that we encounter major historiographic difficulties for this time period. That means there is a paucity of evidence of actual rituals, certainly until the fourth century. We have very few 
um, witnesses to question, particularly question ways of facing death, uh, dying, being buried and remembered. The exception there, of course, is the dying and death and memory of the martyrs. That we know uh, some things about, and it is actually very helpful. But in terms of um, actual ritual texts or other evidence, we do need to remember um, that there is a paucity of evidence and not put too much, too much weight on the evidence we do have. Because typically it is filtered through lenses of, uh, let's say, status, uh, not to invoke class. Um, it's connected to who can write and write down an eyewitness account or to burial places that have um, been visible throughout history rather than a peasant just being buried in the ground in a shroud. We have no witnesses to that. So the witnesses we do have, A, are few, and B, are filtered um, through issues of region, status, uh, and other such markers of identity. With that, let me sketch what I think we can say, certainly about the earliest time periods. And we begin with two biblical stories, actually, that shape, New Testament stories, I should say, that seem to have shaped profoundly early, earliest Christian understandings and practices of dying and death. The first one, obviously, um, is the dying and death of Jesus. And I would emphasize here in particular um, that we don't jump too quickly to the death of Jesus. In the New Testament, there is witness, there are witnesses to the dying and the moment of death of Jesus, and that's important. Uh, for example, Jesus, according to the witnesses of the gospel, in their different ways of telling this story, um, dies with a psalm or two psalms on his lips. Um, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Psalm 22. And almost more importantly in the end for rituals surrounding uh, dying and death in Christian communities, a reference to Psalm 31, 6, into your hands I commend my spirit. What you see on the screen is a very early depiction of a crucified uh, Christ from the early fifth century. Um, I flag it here because it juxtaposes in a quite powerful way a good death and a, what is coded in the Gospels as a not so good death. Where's my... Here. Uh, and both are linked to a tree. So here is the tree of the cross. Um, uh, Jesus, as in most of the early depictions, uh, is not the medieval Christ with the head tilted, who is clearly dead, but a triumphant Christ. And on the other side is the death of Judas, also on a tree, with the tree not upright, but bent, and the coins clearly identifying Judas on the bottom here. So for Christian rituals that emerge around dying and death, this is, of course, the, the important image. 
Now, if we look further into the New Testament, there is another death that becomes important for Christian ritualizing, and this death itself is already mirrored uh, onto the death of Jesus. I'm talking about the death of Stephen, of course, the so-called proto-martyr, the first martyr for the Christian faith. This is a Romanesque image, um, 12th century from a monastery in Switzerland, um, which is valuable for my purposes, for one thing especially. I'll talk about it in a, a second. In the story in Acts, and it's Acts 7, uh, 54 to 60, Stephen's death is clearly modeled already on Jesus's dying. And there are two things in particular that Stephen in his dying picks up from the dying of Jesus with one interesting twist. Stephen forgives his enemies as Jesus did actively on the cross. Father, forgive them. They do not know what they are doing. And then Stephen also practices a commendation. I commend my spirit, again in a sense going back to Psalm 31, 6. But, and here is the twist, Stephen in commending his spirit, and you see it visually here, commends his spirit into the hands of Christ. So the hands that are crucified, um, which this picture um, shows so very clearly. So Christologically, this is important because we have an early witness to the resurrected Christ mm, taking a place, the, a place of God, not in the sense of replacing God, but Christ here has the place that in Jesus' dying, God has. You commend your spirit to. I should also say before I move on that um, we'll be getting to some rather dense PowerPoint slides with lots of subpoints. So I'll be posting the PowerPoint in Canvas in case you get frantic about writing all this information down. That doesn't mean you shouldn't keep notes, but you don't need to keep notes of every little detail, okay? Consider that a footnote. Now, as we move beyond the New Testament accounts and into the early century of the Christian tradition, even with the paucity of evidence, we see the emergence of Christian themes, in a sense, that seem to be superimposed on existing practices in the context in which Christianity grows of burying the dead, well, accompanying the dying, burying the dead, and remembering them. And the themes are this that we see emerge. Obviously, the dying and death of Christ, which in a sense begins to be taken as a model already by Stephen, who dies as Jesus died, at least in a couple of ways, forgiving one's enemies, commending one's soul, one's spirit, one's life, into God's hands. Um, 
Uh, second, um, baptismal themes merge with practices of uh, dying and death, and this, of course, is because of Romans 6, the key text for uh, understanding baptism as a dying and rising with Christ, as opposed to um, John 3, where the baptism, the emphasis is really on new life, baptism as womb. Romans 6, baptism as tomb. The Eucharist comes to be linked in quite early. Again, there is biblical precedent, and it's particularly the Gospel of John. Whoever eats this bread will live forever. And so by the early second century, Ignatius of Antioch describes the Eucharist as the pharmakon athanasias, the medicine of immortality. A and there are ritual connections that get played out that I'll talk about in a second. But for now, just note that the Eucharist is importantly linked, comes to be importantly linked as a sign of life beyond death, the medicine of immortality. A fourth element that is important to add in here is a particular understanding of uh, the Christian life, in a sense a, a key element of Christian spirituality is this understanding of earthly life as a pilgrimage into God's own eternal life. And that, of course, then means that you understand and live and ritualize dying and death, not as an end, but as a transition into a larger life that you've been a part of. Um, since your baptism or since your physical birth, um, however you want to understand it. The last element that plays into emerging practices in complicated ways is an, uh, an appreciation, Christian appreciation, of the dignity and the resurrection of the body. not only the resurrection of the person, sometimes under, that can be understood as this floating ethereal soul, but Christians emphasize the dignity of the body that has lived, is dying, and has died. There, there is a complicated relationship there to uh, the, the Greek philosophical understanding of death as a separation of body and um, immortal soul, which uh, um, was present in the context in which early Christian communities emerge. Now, in terms of earliest ritual developments, what we Witness is a slow Christianization, for lack of a better word, of a fundamental part of each human life, a journey each person takes from living to dying, including active dying, so the last phase before actual death, to being dead, buried and remembered. That is not a Christian special. But Christians stamp this natural process with, Christ, with a Christian or several Christian stamps. Important to remember, as I said before, the ritualization that becomes visible is not a process ex nihilo, out of nothing, but th th that journey, that human journey was ritualized before Christians ever 
come around in the cultures in which Christianity emerges and Christian ritualizing develops in conversation with what is already there. And what is there are really two Mm. Let me backtrack and fill in a, a couple of things. Um, I want to flag, and you can consider that a footnote, but it, um, that it's not only broader cultural contexts as such that shape ritualizing around dying and death, but for example, also geographic realities. So just one example, in hot climates, the dead, whether they are Christian, Muslim, whatever, simply by the reality of the climate, the dead have to be buried in the ground quickly to prevent diseases, contamination, what have you. So when Christians find themselves in these contexts, ritualizing has to take account of that fact, whether it's Christian or not. On the contrary, in Arctic regions, you cannot put the dead in the ground because it is frozen for much of the year. That reality has ritual consequences. Namely, you, you bury in stages in a sense. So all that is to say it's not only human-made cultural context that shapes practices of um, accompanying the dying and burying the dead, but everything beginning with the basics of uh, geography. Now, two elements of the cultural context that um, are important for the emergence of Christian uh, practices and by importance, I mean not only that they immediately uh, fed into Christian practices, but it's the background against which Christians, sometimes in contradistinction to the context in which they live, shape practices of um, accompanying the dying, dying, burying, remembering the dead. So the first context is uh, the Jewish context in which Christianity emerges. Uh, uh, Judaism at that point um, considers the corpse ritually impure. And ritual impurity is something else than moral impurity. It has nothing to do with the person who has died being a bad person or a good person, it's, it's an impurity that is accrued by the body being dead. Um, Jewish culture also has a clear preference for burial in graves, tombs, or catacombs, which is different from uh, the Roman culture at the time that preferred cremation. And for the intertestamental period, at least, uh, we, which means by the time Jesus uh, comes to be born, uh, this exists, um, we have seen emerge the practice of prayers for the dead and a belief in resurrection. The second, I, this is woefully short, but um, I'm, I have a lot of other things to get to, that's the excuse. The second um, context to flag is the Greco-Roman uh, 
context. Important here is um, a philosophical understanding that makes its way into um, Christian thinking quite quickly of death as a separation of body and an immortal soul. Going back to Plato and others. But in terms of the Roman funerary context, what is important is, amongst other things, that um, there are specific elements in, the, in this funerary context that um, leave traces in Christian practices. So, uh, for example, and I think Ruth Duck mentions this, um, a coin is put in the mouth of the dying or the dead uh, person to pay uh, the, the ferryman who takes you across the river into immortality. There are, is ritual wailing and lament as a part of the ritual practices around um, someone dying. So it's not a simple emo or not only an emotional response. Even if you were glad that someone died, there would be ritual wailing and uh, lament over that person. And the person, there is a journey from the person having died, typically in, let's say, a home or a domestic context. There is a ritual procession to the cemetery for an actual funeral, uh, frequently in the form of cremation. And following the funeral, an elaborate funerary banquet. So you eat in the place of the where the dead person rests. And you repeat that uh, the, those that practice of eating in honor of or in communion with the dead person. Um, at certain days or days of um, anniversary days. And in terms of the Greco-Roman context, care of one's ancestors is an important familial and moral duty. And you still see that in, in cultures today around the globe, that care for one's ancestors and remembering them and um, ritually commemorating. This isn't just a thinking back. There are pra ritual practices connected with that are, are an important duty for those left behind. Now, Christianity. We have some fragmentary evidence initially many of them connected to the dying of martyrs. A, a, a very key element become, becomes this commendatio, commending one's spirit into God's hands. Often by quoting Psalm 31, 6, and thereby quoting Jesus, and Stephen quoting Psalm 31, 6. Second, uh, Christians clearly favor burial over cremation, which was a ritual option in their context. Uh, and probably because of the example of Christ, who was buried but also probably related to, to this strong insistence on the dignity of the human body, whether living or dead. Um, 
Christians begin to critique and distinguish their practices from uh, the practices of their cultural, Greco-Roman cultural context. Um, and particularly at two points, um, they encourage psalm singing instead of the ritual wailing laments. And some early Christian authors, Tertullian uh, comes to mind, critique the ostentatiousness of some elite, probably Greco-Roman, funerary uh, rites. Can we assume from that that Christian practices of burying the dead were simpler? Maybe. Um, it could also be Tertullian being grumpy. Um, we begin to see the practice of offering the dying, um, the, the Eucharistic bread, which comes to be known as viaticum, food for the journey, instead of the coin for Sharon, the ferryman who takes you across the river to the netherworld. And in fact, the Council of Nicaea in 325 um, states that every Christian should receive the Eucharist before death as they face dying and death. From some pagan authors, interestingly enough, uh, we know that uh, Christians took care of the body of the dead. And uh, Julian, who is known as Julian the Apostate, uh, writing in the fourth uh, century, notes especially um, during pandemics and diseases when corpses were simply left to rot. Um, Christians accorded even corpses of people they did not know and corpses that might be contaminated by disease uh, ritual honor. Uh, we begin to see this feature in Greco-Roman funerary practices of having banquets, meals, uh, on the day of the funeral. Um, but of course, Christians uh, don't just eat. They actually begin to celebrate the Eucharist in cemeteries. We have an early um, text from the first half of the third century, the Didascalia Apostolorum, which encourages Eucharist in cemeteries, arguing against uh, the uh, fear of ritual impurity. It's important to remember this, this text comes from a, a context with the um, strong Jewish population. And so the sense of the ritual impurity of the dead and of corpses and cemeteries lingers there. But the Didascalia Apostolorum is very, very intentional to say and celebrate the Eucharist on cemeteries uh, because Christians who have died are not, their bodies are not subject to ritual impurity. Uh, interestingly, there is an ethical um, mandate that becomes visible of um, members of the Christian community, especially affluent members, being encouraged to provide funeral places or burial chambers for the poor. So again, that speaks to the dignity of the body alive or dead. 
And then we begin to see Christian-themed commemorations of the dead. And when do Christians uh, place those commemorations? Well, two immediate uh, um, markers uh, emerge on the third day, hearkening back to Jesus' own resurrection. And then, especially for martyrs, on the anniversary of their death. which comes to be marked actually as the Dies Natalis, the day of birth into eternal life. Okay. Hints of actual rituals in earliest cent centuries, very few. Tertullian, I mean this is, this is early, we are in the beginning of the third century already mentions an appointed office, including prayers for the moment of burial. So Tertullian at least seems to have known something, some ritual Christians did as they lowered a body into the ground. And it apparently involved a presider, a priest, presbyter, praying. But that's about all we can deduce from um, Tertullian. The first actual prayer we have is a, a, a mid-fourth century prayer um, by a, a, a bishop in Egypt, Serapion, and I have copied it into the PowerPoint for you. As I said, I will post this text for you to take a look at it again. It seems to be older than Serapion. He didn't make this up because parts of it are already found in grave inscriptions, so material evidence uh, prior to Serapion putting it into a collection of prayers for his use and the use of uh, others. Um, what's interesting if you do study the uh, text in some more detail is, uh, well there are several things that are interesting, but one is that it has mostly Old Testament references of who is remembered or who is uh, uh, called upon uh, to make meaning with. And then it does have this typical structure of God being identified in relation to what you are praying about, uh, God being reminded in a sense, or human beings being reminded of what God has done in the past, and then the actual intercession session in a sense the prayer for uh, the person who has died. And this prayer seems to be at this hinge point, ritual hinge point of someone having died let's say in a domestic space and now having to be carried to the place of burial. People were not buried in the garden of the home let's say. Uh, Typically, the dead were buried um, at some distance to the home. And there are reasons for that. Okay, a um, couple of other hints of rituals um, from these early centuries. We do have visual evidence, especially of funerary banquets in the catacombs in Rome. So these are burial chambers of wealthy and hopefully not wealthy Roman Christians. We're in the late uh, third to early fourth uh, centuries. 
And um, in one of the catacombs especially, I should have added in a picture, but it's so unclear and so contested uh, <laughs> that the, uh, the range of interpretations is, is exceedingly wide. But it probably, I'm leaning my, out of the window here, uh, it probably is, um, it depicts a funerary banquet. Um, a bit later on, Jerome and Chrysostom both witnessed to singing and chanting of psalms at funerals. And we already begin to see particular psalms that, that come to be flagged as appropriate. And guess what? Psalm 23 is one of them, no surprise there. I think I already mentioned the connection of celebrating the Eucharist and the, uh, not only at funerals but also at commemorations of the dead. Mm. Okay, let's move on because we have a lot more to get to. Three ritual spaces become visible in this process of dying, death, burial, and commemoration of the dead. I had to think about this map um, when the media covered, it seemed like forever, the um, process between the, the death of Queen Elizabeth II to her being buried. Now you might think, oh that's because she was queen, but actually the, the process of um, ritualizing the, the the moment of accompanying someone who dies through death, through moving the body from, let's say, domestic space to ecclesial space, and then to the space of burial. This is, this, these are ancient rituals. They might not take 10 days or however long it took um, with Queen Elizabeth, but they took time. So the three ritual spaces that emerge are, of course, first the domestic space, the home, the deathbed, um, one account of, um, and it's a privileged and elite account of this process of accompanying someone who is dying into death uh, in the domestic sphere is Gregory of Nyssa in the fourth century. He writes about the dying and death of his sister Macrina, um, who was uh, who lived in a man domestic space that at the same time was a monastic space. And uh, Gregory talks about all night vigils with the dying. Macrina with psalms and hymnody until she dies. You, there is a movement of the person who has died and the community who has accompanied her into ecclesial space. So you move the person who has died into a church. think for Queen Elizabeth Westminster Abbey. And uh, then you move the body to a funerary space. Grave, cemeteries, early on, catacombs, you name it. Now that's an ideal, in a sense, uh, map 
uh, if you die in a battlefield, the process will be different. Um, what's important is that this ritual journey simply maps a quite natural progression. Someone dies, you remove the body from the home, you dispose of the body, either with in cremation or burial, at a new place. And you can see how this is a, a rite of passage, very clearly, from one status, being alive, through dying, death is the threshold space, to being incorporated into a new status, which is being dead and being remembered. Okay. This, the ritual of mapping this journey uh, comes into view more clearly with um, early medieval times and um, more textual evidence. Two things to remember with these first last rites is that they are not simply funerals. There is a whole ritual process involved that we have unlearned, sadly, about how to accompany the dying. How to bring the body of a deceased person into ecclesial space. How to bring them into to, um, the, the a place of burial. There's a ritual procession here. And in, I should keep this until later, but basically in contemporary culture, uh, what has happened is that we pluck out one particular element of this ritual process, the funeral, and think that's all Christians are really doing. Okay, yeah, I just told you what the second point is, that it's a whole ritual process. Of course, it's also a natural process. The importance for me is that it, it is, was, should be a ritual process that be begins with facing one's own dying, with accompanying a person who is dying onto remembering the dead. Now, we do have a first uh, witness um, to this process, ritual process, and it comes in what is known as Ordo Romanus 49, and then the Commendatio Anime. I hope to be able to get to that, we'll see. Let's focus on Ordo Romanus uh, 49 first. Um, the three sites are clearly visible, and well, what are we looking at when we look at uh, Ordo Romanus 49? It's one of the earliest witnesses to ritual, Christian rituals of dying and death. We are in the seventh century, but probably by the time we have the texts, they witness to earlier practices. And probably it's, um, the practices are Roman, uh, because this ritual is embedded in a collection of uh, uh, rubric books of the church in the city of Rome. So a particular location, a particular time and space, and a written text for a ritual progression. This is where the information will get dense, so don't... Um, don't forget you'll have access to all of this in PowerPoint. Um, the first site is in the house at the deathbed of a, a person at the approach of death, viaticum is given to the person dying, so the Eucharist, and the reading of the Passion of Christ is begun. And uh, you begin with 
uh, Matthew probably and read one passion after the other for as long as the phase of active dying is. At the moment of death, there are particular rites introduced. And it's a sonic world that is created, interestingly enough. Not that the reading of the Passion isn't a sonic verse, but this seems to be chanting that is introduced. And this is what is listed in this early document. Um, rather than the details, I want to draw your attention to the um, multidirectional paths of the words. The saints of God are called upon to come to the help of this earthly community that accompanies a person dying, the angels. Then the person dying is addressed. May Christ take you up who called you, may the angels lead you to the bosom of Abraham. And then a key psalm that reappears, at least in the Western tradition, in um, rituals around dying uh, is inserted. And it narr it's a, a psalm that um, narrates Israel's exodus from Egypt. And what really happens theologically is that the person dying is inscribed into God's foundational story of liberation from bondage into freedom. And then the person is, um, the dying person is addressed. May the choir of angels take you up place you in the bosom of Abraham, this image from um, Jesus' gospel with Lazarus who once was poor, may you have eternal rest. A prayer, we don't know what, it just says prayer. And then a washing and clothing of the corpse. They are placed on a beard simply utilitarian to be able to carry them and more psalms and antiphons. So that's the domestic side. The progression is to side two, which goes to an ecclesial space, to a church and on. So again, um, this is richly uh, scripted probably coming out of a monastic context. It's hard to imagine this in uh, being the burial of every peasant in the middle of nowhere. Um, and interestingly, um, this multi-directional conversation continues. An antiphon actually makes the person who has died speak. Um, a psalm, Psalm 42 uh, is the dear longs for uh, living waters. Uh, then again, an antiphon addressing the person, may the angels lead you to paradise, and the person who has died speaking again, answer when I call Psalm 4. In the church building itself, These are the instructions, all pray without ceasing for the soul of the departed. Psalms and responsories are suggested, readings from Job, a vigil with psalms, and a funeral Eucharist at some point. And we move to site three, the place of burial. Procession from the church to the grave, 
Again, the instruction is with accompanying psalms and antiphons. And the person who has died continues to speak. Open for me the gates of righteousness. Having entered them, I will praise the Lord. And uh, Psalm 118. Now, lots of uh, details. If we step back and look at this ritual procession, the highlights, I think, would be these. That accompanying the dying, burying the dead, and then remembering them, the ritual doesn't speak to that, um, is, is one journey celebrated as a procession in a sense. Uh, second, the liturgy simply follows a natural process. Someone is dying, someone dies, is removed from the house, carried into church one last time, and is buried. In some ways, in this early ritual, death is understood simply as part of the human a condition. There is no um, overarching fear yet uh, on death or concern about uh, punishment or sins or that in that early ritual that simply isn't present. What is present is that dying and death and burial are lived in a communal ecclesial context. And within a Christian context of meaning. And this Christian context of meaning is imprinted via four things. Um, you can think of them as the four P's. I mean capital P. The presence of the ecclesial community. The focus of this is not the family. It's not a minister who comes to visit a person who is dying. It seems to be an, an ecclesial context. Might be a monastic context, which, um, yeah. The presencing, second P, is the presencing of the passion of Christ. You inscribe the person dying into um, the dying of Christ by way of rereading the Passion. The third P, Psalms, and the fourth P, prayers, some of them may be extemporaneous. The dominant image of this ritual, I think, is uh, the journey of a dying person into God's own life that is being ritualized. Maybe as a footnote here, the journey for the dying person does not end with death with actual physical death. Um, think of uh, uh, some of the uh, conversations that are going on. The, the person who has died continues to speak. There is a clear sort of sense of this person being accompanied by angels to paradise. Um, the, the image is Luke 16, 22. Lazarus is carried by angels to Abraham's bosom. And it's very clear in this uh, uh, antiphon, may angels lead you to paradise, may the martyrs receive you at your coming, lead you to the holy city of Jerusalem. May a choir of angels receive you and may you have eternal rest. So in other words, if there is a ritual process into 
dying and death, the ecclesial community accompanies the person who is dying and hands it over, hands the person who has died over to a community that comes to meet him, the heavenly hosts, who then accompany that person into life eternal. It's actually um, ritually very beautiful, I think. Yeah. Theological emphases in this ritual, uh, dying as an Easter exodus, a path into life in fullness, liberation, and a Passover in the footsteps of Christ. I think the earliest or most important gospel actually you start with is not Matthew as one would expect, but John, which is interesting. The last rite in this early ritual is um, not extreme unction or anything as it develops later, but the Eucharist. And as I said earlier, this is since the Council of Nicaea, this is the practice the dying person uh, receives, should receive the Eucharist as food for the journey. Um, the, you might wonder, well, what on earth about the bereaved? Aren't funeral liturgies for the bereaved? That might be the A narrative today. That certainly wasn't the thinking behind Auto Romanus 49. Um, the ecclesial com accompaniment of the dying and the dead is the pastoral care of those left behind. I am not suggesting to you that you need to run and now uh, conduct rituals around dying and death in this way. I'm simply marking this in contradistinction to what many of you will be familiar with and called upon to do. This is a very different ritual context. We don't have that much time. Um, soon after um, Auto Romanus um, 49, a century later, we have another text, the so-called Jalone Sacramentary, and in it we see the first, um, it gives us a more detailed um, ritual for the moment of dying. Um, and it gives us a ritual text for what the priest and it is a priest is supposed to say at the moment of uh, death. I'll just read you a couple of uh, the phrases from this. And what I'll put on the board in the meantime is a very famous image from the Jalone uh, Sacramentary um, that doesn't come in the section from which I'm quoting but is the beginning of the Eucharistic prayer uh, the, as it is um, appears in the Jalone Sacramentary, and it depicts um, the death of Christ, obviously, but linked to the celebration of the Eucharist. This is the page the priest would have turned to as he begins the Eucharistic prayer. Further in the document, this is uh, what the priest is praying, no, not praying, actually saying, to the poor person as they actively die. Set out, Christian soul, from this world. In the name of God, the Father Almighty, who created you. In the name of Jesus Christ, Son of the living God, who suffered for you. In the name of the Holy Spirit, who was poured out upon you. In the name of angels and archangels, thrones, dominions, principalities, powers, apostles, martyrs, confessors, bishops, and so on and so forth. And then the conversation, in a sense, the direction switches. Receive, Lord, your servant in good habitation. Set free, Lord, the soul of your servant from all the dangers of hell and from all evil tribulations. <clears throat> 
it's quite a, a long uh, prayer. I'll uh, spare you the rest if you want to read more about this prayer. It's in Go Forth, Christian Soul, the biography of a prayer. Anybody recognize the beginning of the prayer? Go forth, Christian soul, from this world. Okay. If you watch the uh, memorial service for Queen Elizabeth II in Westminster Abbey, you will have heard um, the Archbishop of, Archbishop of Canterbury invoking this prayer from the Jalone Sacramentary. Uh, it has moved places, so it hasn't come at the moment of death, although who knows? Someone might have prayed that at the moment of Queen Elizabeth's death, but it comes in what is called the commendation in this ritual go forth a Christian uh, soul from this world. The musicians amongst you might also know it from this powerful setting of uh, The Dream of Geronsius by Edward Elgar. Listen to it sometime, it's stunning. Moving right along, I'm going to skip visual witnesses to rites surrounding death. I've focused on texts. There are some visual witnesses um, in this early time. Um, go hunt for it um, if you want to. Not now, um, uh, but it exists. Today. What can I say? Just a couple of markers. What are distinct features of our, in our time around dying, death, and burial? I think clearly there is a medicalization of a death. I'm not the first one to note this. Um, and it has shaped practices for decades now, a medicalization of death. We seem to leave dying to the medical establishment and then the church supposedly comes in when someone has died to take care of burial. Um, there continues to be a, a vast silence around practices of uh, dying and death with concurrently now a cultural re-emergence of wanting to face finitude. Think of um, uh, thanatomusicology, think of death cafes, uh, uh, think of um, the Stanford project of writing a last letter. So we, we have seen in contemporary culture, I'm talking of the US here, some um, pushback to a, a vast uh, silence and hiding of practices of dying. Um, I just want to flag another point, uh, especially in the US, uh, practices of burial are hugely non-sustainable, hazardous, especially with practices of toxic embalming chemicals and huge amounts of non-natural materials that human beings are uh, quoted, uh, uh, quoted, are buried with. Footnote, yes, I have a green burial practice uh, coffin in my office. I hear that there is, um, the student grapevine talks about this from time to time. So yes, I have uh, my own coffin in my office. It's currently a shelf. When I die, the shelves will go out and my body will go in. I mean, this is, you know, if, who knows, I might drop dead uh, above the Atlantic Ocean and drop into the sea, then forget about that. Someone else can, can use my, um, my shelf. Uh, 
Um, but it, it is a conscious decision against these utterly unsustainable, hazardous, toxic uh, burial practices um, that reign in this culture. Uh, theological challenge, and then I'll shut up. I think our challenge is to reinscribe, maybe, the, a larger Christian vision of how to walk towards our own dying, face death, think about um, that as a, as a Christian ritual journey and how to do that in a context, cultural context, that goes in other directions. Just one example, in, in many um, funerals nowadays, in this context, that's all I'm talking about, um, you, you want to highlight a celebration of life of someone. So you look back and celebrate the life someone has lived. In a sense, there is nothing wrong with that, but a Christian vision is so much bigger than only that. Um, how to resurrect that larger vision um, is in your hands.